but the economic cost of the war is, is very clear. The, the initial shock was just astronomical. GDP declined by 30%, unemployment rate went all the way up to 35%. And this is despite the fact that many, many millions of Ukrainians left the country. Uh, so imagine it's not just your denominator is shrinking. It, it's also your numerator is expanding so much that you have to have so much unemployment. But even then, it's hard to comprehend what does it mean to have your GDP contract by 30% in a matter of a few months. So it's as if, you know, you take the Great Depression and you compress it into two months. The clear is that people often think that a lot of destruction and fighting happens at the front line and nothing else in Ukraine is much affected. Uh, there is, you know, some truth to this, uh, of course, when you look at the intensity of war reports uh, compiled from the media, you see there is huge intensity here at the front line. But then when you look at war reports from other parts of the country, so this may be a missile uh, attack, it may be shelling, it may be some shooting, um, you see that none of uh, Ukraine is, is really safe. You can have attacks in Lviv, in Kyiv, in, 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 in Odessa. Uh, so, you know, it, it, the economy is affected everywhere. You, this figure here is from the National Bank of Ukraine. It plots two times series. The real GDP, that's the red line, and the dashed line is potential GDP. I told you real GDP declined by 30%, right? A massive collapse here. This is the first round of Russian aggression when uh, we had occupation of Donbass and annexation of Crimea. Uh, what is really different between here and here is that we have a huge contraction in potential output. And this is very important when you think about the possibilities that Ukraine uh, has when it thinks about the speed of recovery and, and the size of recovery. So we have a massive contraction here and not just in actual output, but also in productive capacity. Now, why is that? Well, you know, you look at the labor side and you see lots of people left the country. You have many, many millions of internally displaced people. President Zelensky just a few days ago announced that the size of the Ukrainian army is about a million people. That's a huge number, given that the uh, labor force in Ukraine just before the war was about 20 million people. And then you have many, many, many people who were, you know, seriously injured by the war, traumatized and so on. So. You know, you have a huge contraction on the labor side. Now, this is on the labor side, on the capital side. It's also equally striking. You know, think about this. 9% of housing stock in Ukraine has been destroyed or severely damaged. 20,000, roughly, now probably. This is as of September. Apartment buildings are destroyed. So we're talking about millions of people who are affected by this. Airports, bridges, roads, you know, productive capacity. As of Stal Mariupol, it will be here. And it's not just physical capital, it's also human capital. Lots of schools, preschools, colleges, you know, healthcare sector. All of this is affected by the war. Obviously, it's going to reduce the productive capacity of the economy. And then we have a giant reallocation or mismatch uh, shock, if you will. This map here shows the share of restaurants opened in 2022 relative to pre-war levels. And obviously you see whenever we have big uh, military action, this place is just shut down. But even in the rest of the country, you have uh, you know, relatively small numbers. So then you have to take resources from here. This area is directly affected by the war and move them somewhere here. And it's not just restaurants, right? You look at other industries, construction, trade, manufacturing services. You see the war was very, very uneven in its effects on, on this industry. For example, construction had massive collapse and, uh, and trade was much less affected. Industry was affected, but not as much as, as construction. And so we have to move resources. Uh, you, Marcus, mentioned that, you know, we have two models how to, to do this. You know, one is government direction, another one is uh, market-based forces. And uh, normally you see in wars, governments take a very, very proactive role and uh, this is what Ukraine did early uh, in the war. It started to regulate prices and so on. But very quickly, uh, the government realized that that's not effective. For example, they started to regulate uh, prices on gasoline, diesel, and other fuels. And almost immediately, the economy started to experience very serious 
shortages. And so now, how do you achieve this? It's, it's really a combination of various policies and steps. One is decentralization of economic activity. Basically, you should not concentrate your production in one facility because this may be affected. Then you try to missile proof whatever you can. And this mm -hmm. means not only anti-missile um, you know, weapons, it also means, you know, structuring your production in such a way that you have layers of protection. So kind of the first explosion is not going to affect you right away. You also build in lots and lots of redundancies. Ukraine is probably one of the biggest users of Starlink terminals. I don't have statistics for other countries, but it's over 40,000 Starlink terminals. Uh, now, you don't want to depend on Elon Musk doing, you know, something. Uh, you want to have a backup channel, and there are lots and lots of, uh, you know, possibilities here. So Ukraine, typically when it uses Starlinks, it also has a backup channel to make sure that you have stable connections. Uh, this is for uh, steel. This is the orange. This is food. This is uh, transportations, basically transport of natural gas from Russia to Western Europe. This is IT services. Now, what you should see here is that steel industry has been declining quite a bit over time. And there is a big drop here because it's so much affected by the war. You just strike the steel mill and it's not uh, functional for a while. Agriculture is much harder to take out because it's so much land. And you can see that it was much less affected by, uh, by, by the war. IT industry, you know, massive growth here. It was growing double digits for many, many years. Many people don't know, but number one export from Ukraine to the United States is IT services. It accounts for roughly 5% of GDP, 14% of total exports. And you see this little kind of uh, bleep down in uh, uh, exports, but that's not because Ukraine can produce stuff. It's more of an issue of the IT industry globally that they have downsizing in that sector. Uh, just a few days ago, Transparency International um, released new corruption perception index numbers, and you see Ukraine gains three points in the most recent year. This is, you know, the largest number in the world, the biggest improvement. Uh, and you can do this in very, very difficult conditions, obviously. And also, I want to impress on you that this is where we started. This is what Ukraine was when our president was Viktor Yanukovych uh, engaged in rampant corruption, who is now hiding in Russia. It started this slow, and then you continue to grow significantly. So uh, we have to keep in mind that the country is cleaning up its act, even in this very difficult condition. Is, is it The, the current uh, fiscal deficit is about 30% of uh, GDP. It's a huge number. And to be clear, Ukraine is not like, you know, some problematic country that consistently runs this huge fiscal deficit. So you look at what was the deficit before the war, and Ukraine was basically running uh, balanced budgets. Then the war starts, and you see this wide gap between spending, this light green line, and revenues, right? Obviously, this is military spending, defense spending. This dashed line here is what Ukraine collects internally. This green line, solid one, includes also uh, economic aid from other countries, grants. Okay, But even with grants, you look at the size of this bars here, this is the deficit. Huge numbers, huge numbers, right? Somehow you have to close this gap. And this now, after the annexation of Crimea, Ukraine started to spend more, but there is still like an order of magnitude difference in, in spending. Now, when the full-scale invasion started, Russia increased its spending, and so did Ukraine. Now, the gap is smaller, maybe a factor of two to three instead of ten, but still, it's very, very large. And so, this is a big problem, because if you want to match this, you have to uh, get some help. And this help is coming from the U.S. and in other countries. Um, U.S. was, you know, a champion of giving military aid in 2022. Europe was lagging behind. Now they are more even. Um, and so this gap between Russia and Ukraine is, is, is closing. Uh, but we should also appreciate that, you know, when we don't have economic aid, a military aid, you know, if you look at this year, so this is what happens after the first round of Russian aggression. There was really no response. Ukraine was on its own. And this obviously invited more aggression. So when we talk about the costs of not helping Ukraine, we have to be thinking about this.
uh, non-punishment of Russian aggression. There are also two things I wanted to, to mention here to give you uh, uh, two benchmarks. One is about the size of Ukraine's GDP, just to give you a sense of how much uh, resources Ukraine commits to war effort and also how far it can go in principle. So this is the level of GDP. You look at this to this, it's a big number. So it's a lot of resources spent on defense. And also I wanted to mention that this spending that happens here in the U.S., it's all, almost all of that is staying in the U.S. So when you send missiles from U.S. to Ukraine, uh, this is going to be a Lockheed Martin that gets money. It's going to be a Boeing that gets money. Very... And from this figure, you should see several stylized facts. First is that it's not a stable flow of resources. That's not good. It creates a necessary uncertainty, number one. Number two, grants is probably the best source of funding because the economy is so much destroyed by the war. It will be really, really hard to repay these loans. Uh, so we should focus on grants, not, not loans. And yet you see that a lot of funding, a lot of economic aid is coming in the form of loans. And the third thing I want to emphasize here is that when you look at the size of the slight green bars, they are shrinking over time. And if we look at what was happening in January 2024, Ukraine did not receive any money from the United States whatsoever in terms of economic aid. That's a very sad part. Now, Europe is ramping up economic aid, which is great, uh, but it's only a part of the story. There. And we know what happens when economic aid is, is not available. We have sort of an ultimate form of fiscal dominance. You know, if you have a gap that you have to fund, you have to go to the central bank, the National Bank of Ukraine, and basically ask this bank to print money to finance the government. And when you look at 2022, the biggest source of funding in Ukraine was not the United States, it was not EU, it was not none of these countries, it was printing money, the National Bank of Ukraine. And as a result, obviously, you create a lot of inflation, 20, 25%, you know, maybe relative to other countries that also experienced double digit inflation, it was not as shocking. But still, you know, it's very, very damaging when you have this kind of uh, rates of inflation. Now, on the other hand, when the aid becomes available, you can do the right things uh, as, as a central bank. You can tighten monetary policy to uh, not get the economy overheated. Marcus, you mentioned this earlier. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And so they raised interest rates, the policy rate, to 25%. They also fixed the exchange rate to... Uh, create a nominal anchor. And so all of this was designed to keep inflation in check. And maybe not surprisingly, we see that inflation is dramatically coming down. It's actually very close now to the inflation target. That Ukraine had long and distinguished history of banking crisis, currency crisis. Uh, you look at the financial stress index for Ukraine, and you see global financial crisis was a huge disaster, then annexation of Crimea and the Donbass, uh, occupation of the Donbass, that was a huge banking crisis here. Um, and this were the times when the Ukrainian uh, banking system was not prepared for the shocks. Then you have this period here from 16 to 2021, when uh, the National Bank of Ukraine's put a lot of effort in cleaning up the banking system, proofing it, and so on. And so when the war started, the full-scale invasion started, there was a lot of stress. But it was not as bad as we saw here, and also it dissipated relatively quickly. The final thing in terms of challenges I want to mention here is extreme uncertainty. We know this is potentially very damaging. Okay, so these are projections from the National Bank of Ukraine for inflation and for GDP. Uh, what you should see here is that the central bank is projecting gross, but anything between minus 10 and plus 20 can happen. So imagine you have this range of possibilities. You can have a, a major boom or you can have another uh, economic catastrophe. Same with inflation. You can have a deflation. You can have 20% inflation. Um, it's extremely hard to operate in these conditions, right? So your planning horizon is not 10 years, it's not five years, it's not even one year. It's going to be like a week, a month, maybe a couple of months. It's very hard to operate in these conditions. 
And some of this is obviously dictated by the war because you don't know where it's going and, you know, you have questions, you know, if you're going to be around and what will happen with sports, what will happen to the Polish-Ukrainian border. So lots of unknowns. Uh, some of this you can't control, obviously, but some of this unknowns you can control. And this goes back, Marcus, to your earlier question. This uh, commitments from uh, various uh, allies of Ukraine to support Ukraine over time. And you see nothing is happening here, right? That's a source of uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, totally avoidable. This was the announcement made by the European Union that it's going to give 50 billion to Ukraine over the course of uh, four years. It was announced in June. It was voted, uh, approved by the EU summit yesterday. So it's February 1st. And the first tranche Ukraine can expect to see is going to be in March. So there is a big distance between June and March, almost nine months, right? So it, it's really hard to imagine that something like this can be happening when you have an active shooting war. You, you don't have this uh, luxury to wait nine months until the money is going to arrive. And, you know, just there as a reminder, we have $300 billion of Russian frozen assets sitting there. And I find it shocking that this resource has not been used because it's going to be enough to fund Ukraine for at least three years. This is economic aid plus military aid. So I don't see why European taxpayers or American taxpayers have to, to pay for this war. You know, the, the, the Russian government should pay for that. And, uh, clearly, there is an overwhelming majority of people in Ukraine, according to various credible polls, who say we are not going to accept any peace deal uh, and sacrifice some lands. Uh, to achieve this. And in part, this is because Russia has zero credibility in terms of, you know, signing any deals. Basically, it violated every single treaty it signed with Ukraine. But it's also about the people who are left under Russian occupation, and we don't want to leave them behind. So Trotsky was saying that you may be not interested in the war, you may be tired of the war, but the war will be interested in you anyways. So mm -hmm. it's it's we may be tired, but it doesn't matter. You have to keep going. In a way, say that everybody should be prepared for a long war, and everybody should be ready to support Ukraine for a long time. That, that my baseline forecast for how this war is going to end is that Ukraine will win. It will defeat Russian aggression, but it really needs help from its friends. <laughs>